Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second week's course class in this course in Business Information Modeling, Enterprise-Wide Accounting Information Systems, and Enterprise Information Modeling. This week, we'll be talking about just a single topic, that is Introduction to SQL. Now, this is a diagram that should be familiar to you by now. In the first week, I had introduced this diagram as kind of this course schematic, which in a single picture represents what this course is all about. Now, we saw, for example, that the database, which is the repository of all information for the enterprise, is the heart of the enterprise application. It forms a very central, it occupies a very central place in an enterprise application because it stores relevant information about almost all significant business transactions that take place. So if the information in the database is lost, then in some sense, the organization's memory is lost because you don't know what happened. Of course, organizations won't let that happen. They keep many backups and so on, but it's that central to an organization. Now, we also saw that because it's so central to the organization, its design is very, very crucial. It has to be properly designed, otherwise it's not going to meet the needs of users who are all dependent upon the database. Now, we also saw last week during our discussions that people from all functional areas, accounting, purchasing, production, uh, inventory management, everything, have to participate alongside with people from information technology or IT in this whole aspect of designing the database or making any kind of decisions, important decisions with respect to enterprise applications. That's the reason we said that this is a course that is relevant for any business person, doesn't have to be just an IT. In that sense, I also emphasize that this is not an IT course, this is really a business course. Okay, so we saw that all these people have to work together in any of these enterprise application related areas, especially database design. So although the course is going to cover this entire spectrum of what you see on the board, we'll first start with a discussion of structured query language. Now structured query language is the language that is used to access the data stored inside a database. It's important for people to understand this language. That's the first part that we'll be covering and today's lecture will be devoted to an introduction to structured query language. The second part that we'll be talking about is database design, right? That is, how do you design a database that meets the user's requirements and that meets the performance requirements for the application? This is a very important area. It's a, it's a fairly, uh, I would say, exciting area in the sense that you will see when we study this topic that we consider database design completely from the perspective of what are the business rules, okay? So that diagram that we'll be developing or those sets of diagrams are all complete statements about what is this business all about. It says nothing about IT. It says nothing about what information will we need to retrieve it, when would we need to retrieve it, how much of information is going to be retrieved. None of those things. It's going to be talking simply about what is the business. Okay. So in that sense, it's a very exciting that thing that you can design a database from just encoding business logic and business rules, and then whatever information needs to be retrieved can be retrieved. That's a beauty of this database design that we'll be looking at. So that's the second part of the course we'll be looking at. Now, technically speaking, it might be okay to stop the course at this point, which is really uh, focusing on uh, database design and uh, structured query language, but there's no sense in leaving it sort of incomplete. And therefore, the third part of the course will be really talking about how do you design a web-based application that can exploit the database, uh, the, the data inside the database? So with that, we would have covered the entire spectrum of this schematic, which is very nice. And of course, I also spoke about the fact that not only will we simply talk about enterprise systems in this course, we will actually use the world-leading enterprise software system that is SAP. Okay, so that's really uh, where we are headed in this whole course and our focus is in this course in this class is going to be this week is going to be structured query language. 
Okay then, let's get started. Now, of course, in order to learn anything, you have to start with a small example, really small example, so that we understand everything, and then we scale up to larger examples. If we start taking real life examples right from the start, you'll be boggled by the complexity of that application and you won't get the real concepts. So to do that, what I'm going to do is to go back to a classic database uh, that was uh, introduced by this person, Chris Date, who was one of the people who was involved in the whole project to even develop relational database systems at IBM. And we'll just go back to the database that Date used in his seminal textbook uh, to illustrate structured query language. OK, so the database is right here. It's got four tables. And just take a look at this, these tables. In fact, on Blackboard, I have given you a Microsoft Word version of this. And I would suggest very strongly that you keep that document by your side as you go through the rest of this lecture. It's not going to be possible or easy for you to just keep on skipping back to this particular slide. Uh, although, of course, you'll also have the handout, the PDF version of the handout that has this. But I would suggest that you print out that Word document or at least keep it open on a different window and be ready to flip back to, to that. It's the same data that you're seeing here. So we've got a table of suppliers who are all the suppliers. You see that there are five suppliers. Each has a name, a status, and a city. Status of the supplier is something like what is the rating of the supplier, let's say. And then there's another table called parts, which has information about six different parts. For each part, we've got the name, the color, the weight, and the city where the part is presumably stored. And suppliers is, uh, consists of information about all of these things, also the city where the supplier is located. And then there are several projects that our company is doing right now. And here you see the details of all the seven projects the company is involved in. For each project, we've got the project number, the name of the project and the city where the project activities are going on, presumably. And then there's a, a table of shipments, which consists of, as you can see, supply number, part number, project number, the date on which the shipment was made and the quantity of parts supplied on with that shipment. OK, now you can see here that a shipment table consists of information about which supplier supplied what part to what project and how much of the part was supplied on what date, okay? So it's not just information about which supplier made the shipment because the same supplier may have supplied the same part to a different project or the same supplier might have supplied uh, uh, the same project with a different part and so on. And therefore, all of those three things are significant in this case, okay? So that's the idea about this. And of course, we assume that on a given date, the same supplier doesn't supply the same part to the same project more than once. Just an assumption. Okay, so that's the idea. So therefore, uh, in fact, what we actually assume is that the supplier part project combination occurs, uh, a given combination occurs only once in this table. Okay, that's not very important for our present discussion. We'll come to that topic later on. So that's the table that we have for now. And all the example queries that we are going to be doing will be performed on these set of tables, this set of tables. Okay, important point. First, what we'll do is we'll do all these queries simply on paper. Now, it's important for you to write and, or type the queries so that your brain is working on the individual aspects of the queries. Once you get that all going and you understand clearly, then I'll give you instructions on how to execute these queries against an actual database system, the MySQL database that you've installed. Don't worry, you don't have to type in all the data. I'll give the, all of that to you in a file which you can directly import into the database. And after that, you will be able to type out all these queries and see how they work. OK, let's take a look at the very first query that we're going to do. It's a very simple query. It says, show me all the details of all the suppliers. OK, that is, we're saying, give me everything that you've got in the supplier table. OK, so clearly what we expect to see is this. This is just a, rep, uh, a duplication of the suppliers table. You can verify that by going to the previous slide. For five suppliers, we want all the information. That is, we want all the suppliers and we want all the details, which is all the columns. And therefore, you see supply number, supply name, status, and city, which is which are all the columns which are in the table. So in SQL, whenever we are trying to retrieve information from a database, we use 
the select clause of SQL. And therefore, our SQL command begins with select. And select is used for all information retrieval. And of course, in SQL, there are some words which are reserved words in the sense that we cannot use those words for our own things. Like, for example, you cannot have a table called select or you cannot have a column in a table called select and so on. OK, so that's a reserved word in that sense. OK, the next thing we put is star to say, well, star says I want all the columns. Usually in a select clause, you'll be mentioning the columns that you want. If you want all the columns, you just say star. It's a wildcard character standing for all the columns. OK, so in this SQL, we start by saying, well, I want all the columns from the table suppliers. OK, so once again, from is a reserved word. And I've just followed a convention in the slides of putting all the reserved words in uppercase. That's not essential. SQL is not case sensitive, so you could really be typing uh, the commands, the entire command in any case you want. But I think it's good form to use uppercase for the reserved words and lowercase for our words or vice versa. You might choose lowercase for the reserved words and uppercase for our things, uh, our uh, entities like the table names and column names and so on. Okay, choose what you like, but I, I like this style. So once again, from is a reserved word and therefore you cannot have from as your table name or column name or any such thing. Okay, and uh, so the, the SQL command to select, the simplest SQL command to select is you say select, you tell the, the names of the fields you want selected when we'll see examples of multiple fields later on. And then you say from which tables do you want. In this case, we're wanting information just from one single table. And therefore, all we have to say is select star from suppliers. OK, that's a very simple, straightforward SQL statement. The simplest that you can probably think of. OK. Now, important point about SQL. SQL is what is called as a non-procedural language. Okay, This may sound a little nerdy for now, but the point is in a non-procedural language, you don't tell the system what to, how to do something. You just indicate what you want. It's up to the system to figure out how to satisfy that request. OK, so that is non-procedural. You don't tell it the procedure. You just say, look, get me this. I really don't care how you get it. OK, there are several advantages to this. We'll shortly see what we mean by that. But first of all, let's consider an example. OK, let's say you've you had gone out on a business trip. You've come back to your home airport. And for whatever reason, you're going to take a cab to go back home. You can get into the cab and tell the cabbie, look, go to 400 South Orange Avenue, okay? That is, you want him to come to the Seton Hall campus. You're not telling the cabbie how to get there. That is, you're not telling the cabbie, okay, uh, go to the airport exit. Look at the exit for Route 78. Continue on Route 78. Go past Garden State Parkway exit. And then take the next exit, which is uh, for, uh, I think, uh, Milltown and whatever. Uh, not Milltown, I'm sorry. It, it's for... Uh, you know, Maplewood, take that exit and then make a right and then make a left and then go straight and then make a left and then make a right, etc, etc. That's a very procedural way of describing what you want accomplished. A non-procedural way of what you want accomplished is simply to get in the cab and say, go to 400 South Orange Avenue. Okay, so in the non-procedural approach, you're letting the cabbie decide how to get there. Okay, now what are the do's and uh, pros and cons of procedural and non-procedural? Procedural approach, of course, is very cumbersome because you have to know all the details. Non-procedural, very simple. Okay. But procedural approach, you have a lot more control. You can control precisely what route the cabbie takes. But when it comes to databases, we don't want to take a procedural approach. Why is that? The now, what is the disadvantage of a procedural approach? The big disadvantage of the procedural approach, other than the fact that it's more cumbersome, the bigger disadvantage is, let's continue with our example, and then we'll know what the disadvantage is. Let's say you tell the cabbie, okay, go here, go there, take the exit for 78, continue on this. Now take the exit for, uh, you know, uh, Maplewood. And suddenly when you get there, you find the exit is closed, right? And the cabbie, of course, all along has been grumpy. He doesn't like you 
giving detailed uh, instructions. He just wants you to tell him where to go uh, because he knows probably that some of the roads are closed and so on. Right. So you find the road is closed. Now you have to figure out an alternate way to get you to 400 South Orange Avenue. Okay. And presumably, perhaps it's possible that you've never taken a different route and therefore you are stumped at this point. You don't know how to get there. Okay. That's the problem with the non procedure with the procedural approach. With the procedural approach, you have you're relying a lot on your knowledge of some underlying details. And when those details change, you get stumped. You get into trouble. Okay. Now, how does that relate to databases? Well, when you've got a relational database, you've got information about a lot of things stored in a database, and you're trying to extract information from the database, right? If you give step-by-step -step instructions for how to go and get the data, then problem is you've given the step-by-step -step instructions, you've encoded that in a program, the program has been working for five years, and suppose for whatever reason, because of business changes and so on, the structure of the underlying database changes. Okay, then all your programs that have been working for all these years will now stop working because the, the logic of those programs encodes an understanding of how the data is organized inside. And once that changes, the programs stop working. Okay, whereas if the programs had been written non procedurally, just telling the database system, get me this information, then the database system has to figure out how to get the information. And as and when the underlying, underlying structures change, the database system can take account of those changes, just like the cabbie. You get, ask him to go to 400 South Orange Avenue. The cabbie knows which roads are closed, which roads are open, where is heavy traffic, where is light traffic, and accordingly, the cabbie takes you to South Orange Avenue. Similarly, the database system, with its knowledge of currently how things are stored in the database, can get you the information. Okay, so that's the beauty about non-procedural approaches. Now, this is especially important in databases because in an organization, business, things keep on changing all the time. And therefore, you have to make changes to the database to reflect all of these changes that are taking place. And if the details of all of those things are encoded in programs, then programs will stop working as you make these changes. Or alternately, you make changes to the database, and then you have to go back to every program and make the corresponding change in the program. And this is a big, big problem. In uh, in software development, this is called as the maintenance tarpet, right? That you get stuck in maintaining your existing programs rather than writing new applications for the business to be dynamic, right? Any small change, little change you have to make, you're stuck. You have to go back and make a corresponding change to all the programs. So you literally are walking forward inch by inch. In fact, it could even be the case that you take one step forward and you've gone 10 steps back. Okay, so that's the problem. That was the big breakthrough in relational databases. Of course, I'm keeping on using the term relational databases without really telling you what it is. Well, relational databases are the kind of databases that you've looked at so far, the, the basketball database, as well as this supplier project database, where all the data is organized in the form of tables. And the only way relationships across tables are kept is through the key values of the primary keys, foreign key values that are stored in one table that relate to the values in the other table. For example, uh, uh, the team table had a coach ID to tell it who the coach of the team was. The player table had a team ID to tell uh, which team this particular player belongs to, right? So that's the only way inter-table relationships are stored. That's a relational database. And the idea of relational database was revolutionary, although it looks very simple when you look at it. But the primary design of the relational database allows for extreme non-procedural approaches, and which is what enabled organizations to develop new applications much more rapidly than was possible in earlier days.